How does water inspire author Nina Montagnu? Today we're going to find out, but before we do, please hit that subscribe button so you can keep up to date with the latest author interviews and behind the book stories. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to this week's episode of All About Canadian Books. And I am thrilled to have author Nina Montagnu with us as a guest today. Nina is a Canadian ecologist and novelist who has written novelettes, short stories, um, general interest articles, science and nature articles, essays, nonfiction, guidebooks, and textbooks. And we'll be talking to her about her latest novel, a Diary in the Age of Water, which was published by Anana Publications. Nina's story takes place centuries from now in a post-climate change dying boreal forest of what used to be Northern Canada. Keo, a young acolyte, discovers a diary that may provide her with the answers about the Earth's past during the Age of Water. The diary spans a 20 year period in the mid 21st century, and it describes a near future Toronto in the grips of a severe water scarcity. This is during a time when China owns the US and the US owns Canada. The gritty memoir is written by 33 year old limologist Lina. She's a single mother who works in Toronto for Canada Corp which is an international utility that controls everything about water. And she witnesses the disturbing events that lead to humanity's demise. Nina, welcome to All About Canadian Books. Pleasure to be here, Crystal. Thank you so much for being a guest. Now, I'll just jump right in with the questions. So a diary in the age of water follows the climate induced journey of earth and humanity through the generations of four women. And each of these women has a really incredibly beautiful and unique relationship with water. But before I ask you about these women, I would love to know, Nina, what is your relationship with water? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. It, my relationship is obviously, as the writer of, of this book, complex and very likely, you know, how authors in, induct their own selves into the character. So obviously it's at least four different perspectives because we've got four different characters. Um, it's, it's nuanced because I started off as a child being afraid of water. That was my relationship with it. And I quickly turned it into fascination like Da Vinci and studied water. And then that led to a career in water. And I got past the fear and turned it into fascination. I learned how to swim, which helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to work on these things and um, and became a limnologist, which is someone who studies water in all its facets, uh, how it, uh, the biology, the physics and the chemistry of water and the watersheds that impact the behavior and the chemistry of water and its, its structure. So um, yeah, I haven't looked back. I zoom around in boats and all that kind of stuff. And, and water, funnily enough, has only become even more fascinating. The more I learn about it, the more fascinated I am with it. Did you know, for instance, Crystal, that water has, has uh, at least 70 anomalous properties? I did not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those, and what I mean by that is anomalous as in weird, right? Water is weird, by the way weird water that's really cool <laughs> I could talk forever about that but we, we do want to talk about the book at some point yes but you no know, it's anomalous in in um in other words you know how water is in three states right liquid mm -hmm. gas solid in each of those states it's different than anything else that's in that state so it's different you know when it's a solid it's different from all other solids when it's a liquid it's different from all other liquids because other things occur in those states too, right? We have 
lots of gases, nitrous, you know, oxide, this and that. But water as a gas, as a vapor, operates differently. It's like it has its own set of rules for doing things. It's like, I am water. I am complex. I am different. <laughs> it is. It really is. And here's the thing, though. All those anomalous properties are life-giving. Mm -hmm. Water in those, you know, is unique in those ways, and each of those ways points toward life. And this is, of course, why when we are looking out toward the ethers, we are looking to find to looking to find life. We look for water. And of course, today is the day that that uh, <laughs> Perseverance landed on Mars looking for just that right looking for i mean they've already found water on mars so now they're looking for what that, that means which is yeah. uh very exciting very exciting yeah. you just you just light up when you're when you're talking about water <laughs> <laughs> well it's become yeah it's it's really funny i i really didn't expect that it would ooze into all aspects of my life yeah uh, i you know i I went to it as a limnologist in professional sense, but it's also spilled into, you know, my family life, my private life, and obviously my writing life, which is yes. interesting. Now, and on that note, you're, you're four incredible women. Can you tell us a little bit about your, about your girls and, uh, <laughs> okay. and, and, yeah. and their relationships? Yeah. With water. Well, you know, I had a lot of fun putting them together and mm -hmm. figuring out what the relationships were to each other, never mind what the relationships to water were. And of course, their relationship to water has everything to do with who and what they were. So there's, there's Lina, the diarist. She's the main character in the book because the diary is the main part of the book. Mm -hmm. And she's a limnologist. She's a scientist, you know. Uh, commonsensical, practical, yeah. in a sense, or likes to think she is, and just so, right, kind of a traditional scientist, mm -hmm. not looking at those, you know, weird properties of water, thinking that, you know, like water has memory and looking at things askance that way. So she has a daughter who, uh, well, before her daughter, there's her mother. That's the first yes. generation. Her mother, Una, who basically has... Um, helped her see the world in a better way. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, she dies early. So Lina feels abandoned. So she actually has issues of abandonment and that takes her through her life. It also informs how she treats her daughter. She's very protective of her daughter. Yes. And her daughter is Hilda, who, uh, who is very much, very different than Lina because She's been protected, but she kind of spills out of that protection naturally yes. enough, as we do, right? As children, yes. <laughs> if we're pushed down, we kind of push back, right? Mm -hmm. So she becomes an activist, which scares the heebie-jeebies out of Lina, who is very conservative, right? Yes. And her mother, Lina's mother, was an activist too. This I didn't bring up. So there's this uh, reflection between the, you know, the granddaughter and, and the grandmother. And then she, in turn, has a daughter, and that's, of course, Keo. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm giving stuff away here, but uh, essentially, uh, I should probably shouldn't have said that, but <laughs> she, she does have descendants. Anyway, she has descendants, and Keo is one of them. That's actually a better way of saying it. And um, she, Keo, the last character, the one that we start off with in the, in mm. the future, in the dying boreal forest, is different. She's quite mm -hmm. different. We understand this on the first three pages. Yes. And she is like an evolved being and she represents the future. So in some ways, each generation represents the journey of humankind, womankind yes. particularly, but humankind, yes. uh, the feminine in humanity. Mm -hmm. And we start off with the mother and we go through the changes with Lina mm -hmm. and the uh, the resistance to change with Lina again, and then that burst into change with Hilda, and then the actual change with Keo. So yes. it's it's looking at humanity on a larger scale in the, the tiny parts of each of the characters mm -hmm. in a nutshell. So I had a lot of fun playing with all that. <laughs> <laughs> 
as a reader, I really enjoyed getting to know all of the all of the three women. And I'm curious to know, Nina, which which came first? Was it your characters? Was it the story concept? Yeah, as as a writer, what was your source of inspiration for for your story? Well, the, great question. The as with all things, the source was in this case, not that simple, it was complex. I've had, I've had stories come to me in a very simple line. One came to me from a dream, literally. So mm -hmm. a physical, uh, actually, and that dream came from a picture. So that was very simple. And then I created this incredible story out of it. Yeah. This story is far more complex. And you're right, in many cases, it comes from a character and Lina, actually wasn't the character it came from, it came from Hilda. Hilda oh. had been created, I had created Hilda in a short story prior to this book. It was, it's called The Way of Water and it's in several anthologies. Mm -hmm. And it was originally published in Italy in a, a bilingual Italian and, and English publication in uh, a publisher in Rome, um, forget their name, Menzioni Edizioni. Anyway, they had, they'd wanted a story, uh, political, sociopolitical, environmental story. So I wanted to create something that had irony in it. Mm -hmm. So I, I picked scarcity, water scarcity in Canada. Yeah. And of course, anyone who knows Canada in any way knows that Canada is a rich, rich country in water. We have lots mm -hmm. and lots of water. But is that water accessible? And where's that water going? So that's the that's where it comes from. It's very political. Hilda is the main character in that short story. And she is, it's a short story. So it's just a little snippet of her life. And she's dying of thirst, uh, waiting to, to get water from a public tap on the mm -hmm. campus of University of Toronto. <laughs> that's how the story plays out. So there's yes. some things. Her yeah. mother becomes the main character in the book. So mm -hmm. the inspiration started with Hilda, but yeah. became the question, what about the, the mother? What's, you know, she begged, she begged more of a story. So I ended up writing about her mostly. And that's how okay. the diary came about. Now, as a scientist, you know, I, I understand that climate change is one of those things that keeps you up at night. Um, <laughs> oh, you read the article in the Toronto Star. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'm like, oh. So um, while while you're up, like, what what is the um, the what, what I'm searching for my word here? Um, what's the narrative that's running through your head when you're when you're thinking about climate change when you should be sleeping? <laughs> Yeah, well, as I as I said to the interviewer of the Toronto Star, they asked two questions: What keeps you up at night, and then what yeah. else do you do about it? Right? It was two very simple questions demanding. Uh, I mean, that you bring something very complex down to something simple. So mm -hmm. I did that, just that, and I thought to myself, what keeps me at night? The main thing, and this is interesting because it's the same thing that keeps Lena up at night really, uh, if you think about it, it's what's going to happen to my son. I have a yeah. gorgeous son in, yeah. in, living in Vancouver. Um, he's still very young, and uh, but he's made a, a life for himself. He's a landscape architect out there, very successful, and a uh, lady in his life and family in the future, no, no doubt. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what kind of environment is he going to grow up in or is he going to live in and his yeah. family going to grow up in? So I think of that. I think of that tie, the future yeah. generation, um, my son and his family and his children so that he, I'd like to think that he can enjoy the same gorgeous place mm -hmm. that I've lived in and that we've lived in together. And that, yeah, that, that keeps me up. <laughs> thinking, you know, I, I want to leave, I want to be part of a legacy that's leaving yeah. this place to our future generations that, you know, they can look back and say, yeah, you did right, mom, you did okay. And I mean, your, your book, Nina, is 
is eye-opening because it totally, well, it totally freaked me out when I was reading it because, you know, sometimes it, <laughs> it, 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 to, it totally did. I'm like, now I'm losing sleep. <laughs> but, but, it was, no, no, it, but it was just one of those things where, you know, sometimes when you read a book in the future, you think, yeah, 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 yeah. But when I was reading yours, I was like, oh, God, you know, I could see that happening. You know, you could see the polar bears dying and the the ecosystems changing and the glaciers melting. And I was <laughs> and the U.S. coming up. <laughs> like, you know, like, it's funny because you, you reacted to, in, in some ways exactly how I was hoping readers would react. But in a good way. Right? And yes. I mean, about that after, too. But. That is exactly why I chose the diary format for the yes. character that she's writing a diary. Because number one, she's kind of, and I'm sure you noticed that in reading it, she's kind of a, a recluse, uh, mm -hmm. reserved character. She's not mm -hmm. out there, you know, showing her feelings and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in a diary, she's going to put everything in the diary because she's mm -hmm. saying it herself. She's private. So yeah. that's like... So the reader feels like they're peeking in on someone, which of course they mm -hmm. are, which makes it even more tantalizing. So yes. That's number one. Number two, because it's a diary, it also gives it that feeling that it's real. It's gritty. And number mm -hmm. three, I didn't say number two, but number three is I made sure, like Margaret Atwood, that a lot of what I put in there mm -hmm. either already happened, is currently happening, or mm -hmm. very soon will be happening yes. so that it draws from reality so then people have told me about this book they'll say i don't even know what's real and what's not real anymore like what's projected and what's actual real so the 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 fiction blurs in with the non-fiction and it's exactly what i wanted to achieve that oh, you achieved it you achieved it oh, i did thank you thank you <laughs> My job. Uh, <laughs> oh, the one section that jumped out at me. Well, there was a few, but um, when you were talking about the forest fires, that that right. I, gosh, it was. Yes. Like, I think not even that far. Like maybe seven or eight years in the future from here, and how the Americans come up to help us and then don't end up leaving. And I was, I was just like, oh, I'm ready to live off the grid. Like, I, I could not go. Oh, yeah. I just don't see that happening. Oh, good grief. Yeah. But, yeah, but certainly on a positive note, because I think a lot of us, you know, we're, we're very aware of climate change now, but I think that we do have to, you know, we're not powerless. There are things that we can that we can do. And I, this is what I loved about that article in the Toronto Star, because they said to you, you know, what can we do? So I would yeah. like to ask that same question, like, what would you like Canadians to do right now? <laughs> I remember what I said, because I, I remember thinking quite a bit about it. And what I said, I really liked. <laughs> so mm -hmm. number one was do something. And if yes. you're, if you find yourself, there was a quote, I don't know who I, I can't, can't remember who to attribute it to. But basically, it goes like this. They say, if you find yourself in hell, keep moving yeah yeah <laughs> eventually you'll get out of hell right the point behind that though it's it's very at the core of things it's motion mm -hmm. move because if you're you know we have the three f's right uh, is it th yeah three f's uh fight flight and freeze are the three f's in terms of conflict and dilemma Mm -hmm. And what, what a lot of people are doing is freezing. They're in freeze mode to do with climate change. It's too yes. big, complex. It, it compli con uh, contradicts itself even. Mm -hmm. And all these things, what can one little puny human do, right? That's how we, we place ourselves. Exactly. So yeah. doing something allows you to get into motion, so, so you get out of that inertia of freezing, literally freezing and metaphorically freezing, and then you're in motion. And as Greta Thunberg said, mm -hmm. it's, it's when you move, it's when you do something, that mm -hmm. hope comes. And then yes. with hope, hope pulls you along. So, but the first 
step is to get off the inertia, to get into motion, not unlike the hero's journey and story. That's exactly what has to happen. The hero is nudged out of inertia to separate and move. And once you move your, your emotion. So to go back to the, what I said, I didn't say it all like that, but <laughs> that's, that's okay. It, it was shorter than that, I think. So do something. And how would you do something? Plant a tree, do something simple. Plant Love a it. tree, something for the environment. Uh, planting a tree is a huge one because if all we did was plant trees and not mm -hmm. cut them down, yeah. that's the other way to that. Yeah. But if everybody planted some trees, we'd be in good shape. Honestly, that's all we would need to do because that's how much they, they do. It, but I didn't stop there. So that's one thing that you as an individual can do. You know, you can mm -hmm. find ways to plant, plant your own place. So if you have a place, if you don't find out who is planting trees, the next, the school, the neighborhood, the city, yeah. uh, even some other place, if you want to just plant a tree somewhere, yeah. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> <laughs> in a wasteland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tree is a tree. Um, but the other part that goes with that to maintain that motion is find people, join an organization, find your tribe, find those in solidarity, join a group like uh, Extinction Rebellion, join the, um, there's a bazillion of them. There's uh, oh, many groups that are come together called uh, I don't know what they're called, but but they they are they're based on the book Drawdown, which is a hundred solutions to climate change, and they're all very doable. So communities, entire communities, can join, and they're doing this thing. So you can find lots of groups that are doing something, and yes. you know, rebellion is a great one because you feel that. You, yes. you you if you've ever been in a protest or demonstration, you know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. You could do nothing more than just stand there with a placard shouting <laughs> and you will feel that energy of togetherness, of movement. Mm -hmm. So it's not only with that, then comes the philosophy and you're not alone and all those other things, right? Yeah. So then you stop thinking of yourself as a puny human and you yes. think of yourself as a big group. And just yeah. like class action suits, you know, versus a single suit, they, mm -hmm. they have the power. And then you will have power. And we all just have to look at Greta to see what happened there. That's yeah, the amazing. Walk that path that I'm talking about and look where, where it went. Look, look what she's achieved. It's incredible. And she's like, you know, half my age. No, more than that. And good God, you know, if I could achieve even half of what she did at my age, I'd be happy. Oh, I <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those. I. I think I may have said one other thing, but that was pretty much it. Oh, I think the last thing was to um, once you've done that and empowered yourself, then go talk to people who who meet, make a difference. Politicians, local councilors, that sort of thing. Newspapers, even whatever. You know, go go and talk to somebody because the talk is important too, right? If yes. we're quiet, we don't really know what's going on out there. So we mm -hmm. do need to start a conversation and to have it. I, I love that, Nina. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to plant a tree. I actually hey, good, good. plant more yeah, than good. one tree. <laughs> I, 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 I go every year to uh, Philip Pocock School and they plant 100 trees every year. Oh. Um, they are wonderful students there, a wonderful school out in uh, Mississauga and they they invite me to give a talk on water and then I go help plant trees oh it's I love that great. that's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah so schools are doing that a lot which is superb because it does several things it gets the kids involved and yes. gets them feeling empowered too because you know they can be desperate they can they can yes. fall into a funk of powerlessness mm -hmm. but they are so powerful I'm so glad Greta and then Greta's not the only one right there's, um, oh, I forget her name, a lovely lady, uh, indigenous uh, gal who's the, um, uh, Augustine, August, oh, I'm terrible. Anyway, she, she is an, an indigenous lady, young lady, teenager, mm -hmm. is doing amazing things here in Canada. And there, there's many of them 
in all different countries, uh, mostly girls, girls popping up and <laughs> saying what I'm saying. Of it's course. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, the power of the feminine, you guys. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's time. You know what the Dalai Lama said? The Dalai Lama said, the Western woman will save the world. That's what he meant. We need to finally find our voice and speak yes. out. We, yeah. we haven't been. Yeah. A, a wise man. And besides planting trees, Nina, what are you currently working on? Ah, you mean novel wise or anything wise? Yeah, anything well, I, wise. I'm still, yeah. teaching, at, I'm still <laughs> teaching at U of T. I love teaching there, uh, teaching uh, engineers how to write and scientists, uh, nursing students and all kinds of wonderful students there. It's a lovely yeah. campus. I kind of miss that. I teach, uh, I teach home, obviously, right now with COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I am working on some stories. I'm working on a new novel, um, which in fact is going to sort of follow in the steps of this one. It's the same universe. And it okay. will follow some of the characters that are just ah. briefly mentioned in here. And <laughs> we'll find out more about them later, which is kind of exciting. Um, but I also uh, finished uh, a fantasy, a novella oh. that's going to be published again in Italy uh, by a different publisher there, uh, Delos Digital. And they are publishing, uh, it's basically a time travel a uh, story of the past medieval times with a, a baroness who happens to be a witch or is accused of being a witch, but she has special powers and it's all lots of fun stuff. So I write oh, that kind of stuff too. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so Nina, a great big thank you for coming on All About Canadian Books today. Love chatting with you about your novel and learning more about you. I will put links down below in the description box so that our viewers can uh, learn more about you. And also if they'd like to purchase a copy of your novel, the link will also be there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.